Good evening and welcome to Open Your Mind Radio. You have myself, Alan James. And uh, myself, Stephen George. It's Sunday the 3rd of January 2015. Um, I hope you all had a happy Christmas for in the new year 2016. Back to the grindstone and we just don't know what way what way the year is going to go and what's going to happen in the year. But sure, we'll see what happens, Steve. Huh? Yeah, look, we, again, we, we, had a, we had an interesting year last year. Here in Ireland, 2015 was a very interesting year. In fact, most of the years since the crash in 2008 have been quite interesting. But 2015 uh, definitely had its ups and downs, mostly downs. So I hope, I hope uh, 2016 has a lot more ups than downs. Uh, because, you know, we, we went through the mill. We definitely went through the ringer in 2015. So, uh, you know, let's, let's just uh, power a positive thinking. I think so. Yeah. I think let's focus on 2016 yeah. and try and make it a better year. And the fact that your woman, uh, Joan Borton, ended up in the drink anyway. Well, you're going to be telling us about that in a minute. Yes. First of all, we'll, we'll say we have our guest on tonight is a chap called Mark Stevens. Now, you know, we did a pre-record with Mark because Mark actually couldn't make the show tonight live. So we did a pre-record with him on Friday and we were blown away by the information Mark had to say and it's going to be very interesting, especially people who are into the, the, the law and the return to sender and uh, jurisdiction and um, civil or criminal, all that kind of stuff. It's going to be, it's really good information for Mark. But before we do that, let's find out what the communication channels are. Yes, communication channels this evening are... The communication channels are email info at oymireland.com by phone 046 927 and you can also contact us direct through the OYM chat room. Yes, 046 927 is the phone number. Again, that's going to be 00353 if you're calling in from outside the Republic of Ireland. Unfortunately, if you do ring in this evening with a question for a guest, we will, you're just going to have to hope that we already kind of maybe asked it because, uh, yeah, as Alan said, it is a pre-record, so apologies for that. But, yeah, you can also um, you can log on to the... The chat room there, oamradio.com, you will see the link for the chat room. Say hi to everyone who's already logged in and wish them a, a very happy new year. Uh, you can also check out People's Internet Radio as well. We're going to be on there too, monitoring the chat room there as well. And a very happy new year to everyone in there. Uh, what else we got? We have the TuneIn Radio Link app for your uh, your Android and your smart devices and your iPhones and your iPads and all these sort of fancy schmancy devices. Uh, you can go on to um, the TuneIn Radio Link uh, or the store, not the tune, right? like the the, uh, the Google Play Store or the Apple iPhone Store or whatever you call it. I don't know. I don't have an iPhone, so I don't know where you get them from, but uh, the the app is in there anyway, so you can get us on that. We also have the YouTube channel as well. We have a lot of videos up there and podcasts. And Facebook, the anti-social media. We're still on Facebook, despite I watched a video, an interesting video the other day in relation to Facebook, telling you why you should get the hell off it. But anyway, we're still on it there for your your uh, your questions and your comments and your videos and your links and everything else. Although it's social media and a lot of people tell us about Facebook and we all know about it, but it's a, it's a necessary evil because it's a good way to communicate and get information out there. You just have to be careful. Right, Steve, you want to tell us about Joan and what happened, Joni? Yes, iPhone. I tell you, I hope her iPhone wasn't in her pocket. <laughs> yeah, anyone who's been kind of watching the news uh, would have seen that there's a lot of flooding going on. Um, Personally speaking, I've been just saying to people, oh yeah, climate control, uh, weather modification, oh yeah, sure, we know all about it. And people are looking at me, what What are you talking about? I'm going, yeah, all the flooding, you hardly think that's Mother Nature. God, if it is, she must be really peed off with us. I said, no, that's uh, that's uh, uh, man-made as far as, I, as far as I'm concerned, anyway. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of flooding going on in the UK, and we've had some floods here in Ireland. I have to say, the flooding in Ireland hasn't been as bad as the UK. But uh, we we've had our own our own little uh, you know things to deal with, and there has been some flooding in certain parts of Ireland. And people were saying about the government, uh, especially the Taoiseach and the Kenny, that he should be going out and visiting these these places and reassuring the people that he's going to do something about it. Although what he could do about it, I, I genuinely don't know. Uh, but Joan Burton was sent out, and uh, she's had a she had a Titanic experience this week. She wasn't hit by an iceberg, but she did get. <laughs> <laughs> she did get that sinking feeling and it's not just about her party although I think they are sinking as well but uh, yeah she was in a little boat and herself and another lady were in a little boat and it was getting pulled along in, in one of the flood places that had been flooded 
by a, a, a farmer or some local anyway. I think it was up to his, maybe between his knees and his waist. So not very high. And uh, uh, Joan and the other woman just uh, fell out of the bowl. <laughs> they fell out. And poor L. Joan, she had a she had an L smile on her face there. And I, I say again, I don't know if her iPhone was in her pocket. But um, yeah, I, it couldn't have happened to a, a nicer person. Exactly. That was a Christmas gift to it all was, of us, wasn't it? It was. Everyone who, I tell you, everyone who was on the protest for Irish water, you know, uh, uh, protesting against Irish water, I'd say everyone had a fantastic laugh at that. That made, that would have made people's ears. And people captured the photo of her falling out of the actual boat, and some people put Jaws beside her, yeah. and other <laughs> things like that, you know, so it's, it's quite interesting. Oh, yeah, cheer Jaws up, just to see that happening anyway. But, um, yeah, just a couple of things. Two people in the, the music business passed away around Christmas time. Lemmy from Motorhead and Natalie Cole also died. And um, two different kinds of music, but uh, I'm sure we can appreciate the music they played, you know. And um, I think Lemmy was di- diagnosed with cancer, and within three days after that, it was quite sudden, as uh, fast-acting cancer, and um, he died. And uh, Natalie Cole, she was 65, and... Um, I think she had complications. There's a lot of things going on there. A number of things they mentioned. I remember reading about it. So um, RIP to Lemmy and Natalie Cole. Anyway, they're in a better place. Um, the other thing on the list is, <clears throat> you know when you go to the OAM website and you have an option to subscribe to the newsletter. So when we send out emails from OAM, you'll be on the newsletter list to receive the emails. Well, some people have r- registered and put their email in, but for some reason we're getting bounce backs from the email address. So can you just confirm that if you don't receive any newsletters, newsletter emails from us, and um, chances are it might be because we, we kept getting bounce backs, so we removed the actual email address from the newsletter list. So if you want to re-register again using a different email address, if you can do that, that would be great, because um, some emails are bouncing back, just to let you know about that. Um, how's your week, Steve? Yeah, my week's been fine because I'm not back to work now officially until tomorrow. Um, so I've been kind of, I've been taking it easy, you know, just just getting in some uh, R and R, rest and relaxation, and um, lay, lay, laying about the house and doing absolutely feck all, as my wife would say to me. You're doing feck all around this house. I have to do everything, but uh, she's all good at it. You know, I say. Why? Why interfere? <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, the, the one thing that just kind of popped up the the fact that Lemmy from Motorhead died. Ace of Spades. I love that song. I yeah. wouldn't know too many of their songs, but that's that's a, that's a classic. And Natalie Cole. Um, I don't know uh, many of Natalie's songs. I would know the one that she done with her dad, which was Nat King Cole. Mm. Uh, and the slow one, I miss you like crazy. You know that song? Was that her? Yeah. Are you sure? You know, I'm an old romantic. I like songs like that. Well, you're, you're old anyway. Yeah, I'm old anyway, yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway. Oh, oh, by the way, the, just very quickly, we talked about being old. You know the chap I said to you, uh, I was speaking to last night? Yes. When I rang him yesterday to arrange to do the meet-up to have a chat, he said, you sound young, how old are you? <laughs> so I explained to him that I'm not young, but thanks for the compliment. Yeah, you're young at heart. I'm young at heart. My I mean, my my voice sounds young, but when you see me, did he you, know, you go, oh. Was he surprised when he seen you coming in with the pipe yeah. and the stick yeah. and the slippers? I'm, I'm sure he did. I'm sure he did. And then when we were trying to, he said, um, I don't have any glasses, and there's a thing on the mobile phone I want to show you. Have a look at that. And he passed it to me. And I was going, you know, in and out with the phone, trying oh, to focus. No. He said, don't tell me your eyes are gone as well. I said, yeah. yeah. It's going Sorry. Lampy. Sorry. Anyway, I jumped in. Yeah, no, just in relation to Lemmy, uh, say, and, Na- and Natalie Cole dying, or... Well, passing away anyway, going to the spirit world, whatever you, you know, people want to say. Um, I was just actually cleared, and it's funny because I was cleared off a hard drive, as you know. I don't know, I've been having issues, computer issues the past couple of days. Uh, stuff is just kind of strange things that happened to the computer, so hard drives are going up and down. And but I was cleared in one, one particular hard drive, and I came across some files on it. And one of the files was, uh, it said it was uh, Michael Jackson's last phone call. And even I looked at the file and I'm looking like, I'm, I, I have no recollection of downloading it. I have no recollection of ever watching it. So, you know, I said, before I delete it, I'll, I'll have a quick look. And it was uh, some guy, again, I don't know if, if he was genuinely an FBI agent. He said he was. He said his name was, was it Michael Connors or something like that. I think it was Michael Connors. And uh, he was he was saying that, uh, you know, there's a lot of 
um, stuff going on. He said, following on from um, MK Ultra, there was another uh, thing put in place, and he, uh, he he gave the name. I can't remember the bloody name, but would you believe Operation Sedgwick or Sedgway or something like that? Anyway, but he he was talking about this operation where it was to target uh, the youth through music, and he was basically saying that a lot of people in his organ in the FBI are aware of this. He has. He would. He, along with other people, were or ordered to shred uh, documents that they had. But he said he, in good conscience, didn't. So he had some of the. He still has these documents. And I don't know how old this video is. To, to be honest, it could be a year. It could be could, two, three years. I don't know. Um, but he said he had uh, Michael Jackson's last phone call because the phone was tapped. So he played that. Just to, he said, "I'm, I'm going to play this just so people know I'm not bluffing." Mm. And there was a, a couple of minutes conversation between Michael Jackson, allegedly. Sorry. Uh, Michael Jackson and some guy called Dieter, where Michael Jackson was saying, I know they're after me, I know they want to kill me, they're going to frame me, they're going to make it look like a, a suicide, or they're going to make it look like an accident, but I know these people want me out of the way. Now, see me, he was, he was talking about his uh, management company, AEG Music, allegedly, and um, uh, then, what, well, uh, an hour or so later after that phone call, he was dead, see me. So, um, we were just kind of, I, I say, I seen that. I didn't, I don't know if it's genuine. And the only reason I, I'm even talking about it now is because I said it to my wife. I said, I found this on that thing because she's actually reading the book at the moment about Michael Jackson. So I said, you might want, you might want to have a look at that. So she did. And then she started looking up on YouTube and other people are saying, no, it's not real. It's a hoax. And, you know, there's no truth in it. But is, is there? I don't know. Mm-hmm. And then, like, you have these other people down uh Two, two, two very good artists within a short period of time of each other. Again, like, is, is that just, was it going to happen anyway? Or have they been sacrificed? Well, the same... I mean, I mean be, I'm sorry, being diagnosed with, with, you know, cancer and then being dead, like, three days later? Mm, well, I've, I've heard a few cases of that. It's not, it's not unique. I have heard a few cases of people being diagnosed within a couple of days there, they pass over. Yeah. Um, Robin Williams as well. There's a question mark over his death. Oh, there's a big question mark yeah. over his death. Yeah, they're saying a lot of people are saying that he was taken out. Yeah, some people are saying it was suicide. Some people are saying he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and he couldn't live with it. So he yeah he he took the well took his own life. Yeah, exactly. So we we never you, know. You you don't know. You know we don't know. Yeah. But we can just speculate. That's yeah. all we can do. Yeah. How was how was your week? Um, again, like yourself, just uh, winding down for the Christmas, getting things done, but. Um, as soon as kind of the Christmas is over, as you know, Steve, we've the phone calls came in and um, certain things, um, people asking for certain things. And unfortunately, there's only so many projects that we can get involved in, myself and Steve, because we are involved in quite a number of projects. So apologies for the people who asked us to get involved in things, but we, we can't because we just, you know, we're thin on the ground and we're trying to do quite a lot at the moment. Burning the candle at both ends. Of we it. are, yeah, yeah, we are. So we have to prioritise the kind of projects we get involved in. Um, but more than happy to share information if you know if if you want information, no problem with that at all. Um, just the one thing I have on the list is a Sunday Business Post, which I seen this today. Now we all know about the smart grid, and they want to bring in smart meters, and the issues that smart meters have caused over in America, where they're starting to take them out, P and G, where they're going on fire and they're causing health issues with people. Well, according to the Sunday Business Post, the Irish Sunday Business Post. Um, it says households to be charged for refusing smart electricity meters. It says electricity customers will face fines if they do not allow smart meters to be installed in their homes. Smart meters are due to be installed in at least 80% of homes by 2020 to comply with EU targets. The total cost of the project is estimated at 750 million. And you can probably have a good guess who's going to be paying for that. And there's going to be another tax somewhere. So, based on this fact where they're saying that we're going to be charged for refusing electricity meters. Well, having Mark on the show will kind of hopefully clarify a few things. Because let's talk about jurisdiction first and foremost. And where's the contract? I suppose you could argue that point as well. But we're going to uh, we're going to get Mark in. Now, as I say, this is a pre-record that we did on Friday. So, unfortunately, we can't um, take any questions because... Mark won't be live, um, but it's a, it was a very good interview, I have to say, great information that we shared with Mark, and what Mark was saying, um, really enjoyed the, uh, the the interview with Mark, and we were trying to think of the questions that you, people would ask, 
Um, so we apologise if we didn't get all the questions or think of everything. But we will arrange to have Mark on the show again, maybe in a couple of months' time, and we'll try and get him on live if we, if we can, um, because this stuff is very important. Um, but OK, so we're going to put Mark on now, and then we'll see you uh, on the far side of the interview. We'd like to introduce Mark Stevens. Mark has been involved with the, the legal side of things for a number of years. And I've watched a few of his videos, and his videos are very, very really good regarding the information uh, and the legal side of things and where we stand legally. And there's a number of questions that we have for Mark that we want to touch base with him on. So it's going to be great to uh, have a chat with, with him about that. Good evening, Mark. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks, guys. Listen, Mark, thanks a lot for coming on. Much appreciated. I know there's probably a lot of people out there who know you, but for people who don't know you, can you give us a rough bio on your background and what you've been involved in, and then we'll take it from there. Sure. I, I, I hate saying it now, uh, but uh, I've been helping people defend against bureaucratic attacks since 1997. My gosh, it's 18 years already. And um, in a nutshell, I just realize that there's a huge world of difference when you're going in and defending against these attacks when you use issues of law and when you use issues of fact. And I noticed that if you use issues of law, when you raise your own opinion, something that's, of course, subjective and may not be based on evidence, uh, if that does not coincide with what the man in the robe or the tax agent believes, they're just going to deny it. And they're going to be able to look at thousands of their buddies who have in the courts who have ruled you know, against you or against your argument. And I noticed that the burden of proof and the effectiveness of taking just issues of fact and questioning them based on their arguments, I noticed that I was a lot more effective and my burden of proof, if I had to appeal it, was far less. And so what I was doing was, from an anarchist or voluntarist standpoint, I was attacking, collaterally attacking, just challenging, it's all it means in the legalese, I was challenging the foundational arguments that they were using because I had already come to an understanding that the evidence had told me that there was no state, there were no citizens, and that their laws, their political rules, there was no evidence that they applied to anybody. When I started doing that, um, we had a lot more success. And, and then I was able to, after the book, then I, I started working with people outside of the United States and outside of North America. So I, I've been, we've had success in Europe and... Um, uh, Australia and New Zealand, and if you go to markstevens.net, you guys can see documentation that we finally have a, uh, a success story out of Ireland. Okay, and do you want to tell us about that? Uh, it wasn't a government attack. It was a kind of, I believe it was a credit. It was a situation with the credit, and and I've been able to have a lot of success helping people that way, also in North America. Uh, because you guys are probably aware that the credit system, you know, the banking system, uh, just creates, you know, credit. It just, it's not money. That's it's right. used as money. Yeah. And, and so that together with challenging the, the plaintiff's asserted jurisdiction that, you know, the court, uh, together we've gotten a lot of these thrown out. And so what a friend in Ireland did was challenge the, uh, jurisdiction of the court to even hear their complaints. So even before we get into this stuff, whether it is a valid cause of action and whether there is in fact uh, uh, a contract, which of course there's not, uh, before we can even get to that point, they have to still provide evidence, meaning facts that are relevant to proving their argument or claim that the laws of Ireland, you know, the political laws, apply to uh, somebody just because they're physically in Ireland and and that it, it's not something that you can produce. There is no evidence. In fact, I've, I've got a law professor in uh, from Canada who uh, was one of the most recent ones to admit that there is no evidence. And so, because of that, we were, you know, they were able to go into, you know, not have. Well, they would not have. They didn't have to go into the Irish court other than to file the paperwork that the plaintiff's attorney could not overcome and provide any evidence. 
Excellent. Well, we're going to start off there because here's the big question. And this is the, the thing that we're all kind of looking into and asking questions about. And it's this issue of being a citizen and you being sovereign to the country. Now, one of the politicians I sent an email to, because I, I had a question, and I said to him, um, when did I become a citizen? When did I agree to the laws of the land? Okay, so we talk about this social contract, and every, everybody says that right when you're born, your parents go off and they will register your birth, and it's that registration is the social contract, and that's when you become a citizen. And then when you become 18, this is in Ireland, by the way, when you become 18, the government will say, oh, you should register because then you'll be able to vote, blah, de, blah, de, blah. So people go off and register because they know that that contract is null and void because that person is now an adult and they have to re-register, so re-sign up to this social contract. This is what we are thinking it is. We haven't had it confirmed yet. So, so basically, by doing this registration process, now we do know that any contract that's not fully transparent is null and void anyway. So if the government are saying that, oh, well, you registered, so you agreed to it. Well, if you haven't told us exactly what we're signing up to, then it's actually null and void. So what we want to try and establish first and foremost, and I totally agree with you on jurisdiction, is that, you know, because we have common law over here. And I'm trying to establish and trying to find out where is the social contract that says the laws of the land, the laws that the government are bringing in, because Ireland now, since today, I think the, I think the last, today in the last couple of weeks, they brought in something like 14 new laws or 14 new bills, Steve? That's right, yeah. I think it's 18. 18, yeah. okay. And it's just getting ridiculous now. It really is with all the laws that they're bringing in. Really unbelievable. So we... Before we go down the, any rabbit hole, I'd like to try and establish with you, Mark, your understanding and are we on the right you know, thought process regarding citizen, citizenship and registration? I would have to say no. Okay. The, the evidence absolutely does not bear that out. And I'll point out that, that obviously the Irish government, which is just men and women, uh, they're not as violent as someone like Cromwell, that's a given. Uh, they're violent nonetheless. Yeah. And Cromwell wasn't trying to contract with the Irish. That that uh, you know that's uh, and I see it as just a difference of degree. Whether if violence is in the picture, mm. then it, it nullifies everything. And uh, the idea that. Men in government, whether it's in Ireland, in in Scotland, or you, you know Canada, it's it's the same thing. And it, and I go through this in the in my latest book, Government Indicted. It's the same program. I don't care where you are physically standing. If there are a group of people called government there, they are nothing more than men and women who are forcing everyone in a certain geographic area to pay them. That's the be that you begin with those facts, and after any serious consideration and examination of the concept of, uh, of government, you're going to come right back to the same set of facts. It completely nullifies the idea that there is a contract. It nullifies the idea or the legal claim that somebody is a citizen, uh, and and it nullifies any application of any kind of so-called common law, because slavery was part of the common law. Well, and I'm, I, you know, th th there's just no way around that one. Okay, well, this, this is, this, uh, th what I'm going to say probably adds to what you're, you're talking about there. The whole idea of, I do not consent, them words are very important. And we're told time and time again that in the eyes of the law, everything is assumed or presumed unless you say no. So if a woman is being raped and she doesn't say no, then it's presumed the answer is yes. And apparently the law is the same. Now, we are either free or we're slaves. There's no, you cannot be a little bit pregnant. You either are pregnant or you're not pregnant. So if we are free, then when I say to the government, I do not consent, they should accept that as I do not consent because I don't want to contract with them. If they're forcing me to do something against my will, then that's illegal under Article 4 of the Convention of Human Rights in Europe. 
Well, the idea that they're trying to contract with you does is it doesn't hold any water because they're not trying to contract with you. Like I mentioned, you know, using Cromwell. Cromwell, no one's going to say that Cromwell is trying to, in, in the reign of terror that he did uh, to my Irish brothers, uh, you know, because I am, you know, predominantly Irish, uh, that he was trying to contract with them. They're not trying to contract with you. If you ask them, they will tell you it is not based on your consent. They're entire basis of jurisdiction, whether it's for taxation or uh, council tax, you know, things like that, yeah. uh, has nothing to do with your consent one way or the other. It, the entire basis of their attacks against you, whether it's a minor attack or, a, you know, a, be, a big one, uh, is based on the, the political claim that if you are physically in Ireland, our laws apply to you. That's it. They yeah. Use, they, yeah, that's it. They use that as a basis to negate the violence that they are using against you. It's not violence, mate, because we have the law on our side. I've had them tell me point blank. Suzanne Small is the head of the legal department for a tax agency in California. It's not threat, duress, and coercion when we, the government, do it. Right, okay. Which is, um, uh, well... I can't agree with that. You know, violence is violence and threats are threats, regardless of who does it. Well, absolutely, and it's a double standard that people allow for people called government, that if they apply the same principles of right and wrong, like do no harm, aggression is wrong, simple things like that, if they did apply that to those called government, they'd be horrified. Hmm. Horrified. The, the Irish, you know, it did it, it, so... The, the, the history of the Irish people for the last, I don't know, 800 years or so is to get out under the, the, uh, the yoke of these English bastards in, in London. Okay, well, we actually, there's enough information there, out there in our history and information that people have gathered to say that we actually never got out from UK rule. We got home rule. So we got the uh, permission to run the, the country um, under our own government, but it's still controlled by the UK. Well, uh, yeah, right. And it, it all comes down to the same false premise that certain people are allowed and have the right to use coercion to get people to pay them. And it, 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 that, that basic principles of right and wrong don't apply if you call yourself a government. Well, how come this is not ta how come this is not armed robbery? You're, you're threatening to take not only me away but all my property if I don't pay you. Yeah. How is it? Not? Oh, we've got this uh, common law, you know. We've got this law, and we uh, uh, even though it's factually identical to armed robbery if you, one of the plebes, was to do it. Uh, the law says that we can do it. It's BS. It's complete nonsense. And so that completely negates the idea that anyone's a citizen and that there's a state at all. And those set of facts that they force us to pay, that completely destroys any claim that there's a government. And you, Because the idea that you're a citizen, and this goes back to the common law, this goes back over a thousand years. That if you are in the realm, then you are supposedly entitled to the king's protection. And in return for the king's protection, you, ha you have allegiance to follow his rules called laws. Well, that's complete nonsense. Absolute and complete and utter nonsense. Not only do these politicians openly agree and, and maintain for Hundreds of years, there's no duty to protect you and I. The facts tell you that that can't possibly be true, because how could some lunatic, some bloodthirsty animal living in London, how could he have any duty to protect you when all of his agents are forcing you to pay him? It's, it, it, it's ridiculous. It, that's why, you know, you look at the mafia. Are, 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 you, are they actually morally and ethically you know, obligated to protect the people they're extorting? No. Come on. Definitely so, not. Mark, it's the, same, it's the same, isn't it, with the police force in the, in the US of A. I know like, you often see uh, movies and stuff, and it says on the police car to protect and serve. <laughs> and a lot of the citizens or the, the people who live in, in, the, in the country believe that it was to protect and serve the citizens, but it's not. It's to protect and serve the government, isn't it? 
Well, it's to yeah, and it would and to be more precise, it's to protect and serve. They are to protect and serve the political masters, the ones who are pulling the strings, because the cops, the cops are just you know hired guns, uh, literally. Uh, so if we look at this concept of a citizen, a citizen is a member of the body politic, owing a duty of allegiance in return for a duty of protection. That these are reciprocal obligations. This is really old stuff. It's been part of the common law and part of the U.S. and Canada for millennium. And the fact that they are forcing you to pay negates any any idea of, you know, that or claim that 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 there is a duty to protect and that there's a duty of allegiance. They are a criminal organization. That and so because of those facts and that there are no citizens, there is no body politic. And because there's no body politic, there is no state. And if without a state, you have no government. So you have literally just men and women who are forcing us to pay them. They deserve absolutely no respect and deserve no compliance whatsoever. That's why they have to give themselves titles such as honorable or lord. Mm. Yeah. And obviously something that you mentioned there about jurisdiction. Now there, there is a, another chap on YouTube called Bill Thornton. And one of the things that Bill said, I don't know whether you agree with Bill, number one he does say about jurisdiction, but the other thing point he makes is that if you have to go to court and you have to do an affidavit, he said, put everything truthfully on the affidavit. You, when you go into court, he said, you should not really need to talk unless the judge wants to clarify something on the affidavit. And if the judge says to you, um, what do you want me to do? You don't tell him what to do because as a sovereign person, you don't tell them. You say, I wish you to do X, Y, and Z. What, was your, what would be your take on that? My take on that is quite different. In fact, if you and I let the evidence do most of the talking. If you go to my website at markstevens.net, I just posted yesterday another piece of evidence showing that a ticket was thrown out. And I've done this on three continents, and we do not file affidavits. That that to me is something where it, it would require extraordinary circumstances to do something like that. I, I see no need for that at all, and I'll, and this is why. Because the issue of jurisdiction, whether it's civil or criminal, is exactly the same as far as who the burden of proof is on. And that is on the one who has filed a complaint. And to me, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever, knowing and doing the research and, I, and the evidence I have on my website, all the politicians and bureaucrats I've spoken to, in, which include, by the way, the Chief Justice of the Arizona Supreme Court, that none of them can produce a shred of evidence that their laws apply and that there's jurisdiction. So why would I file an affidavit when the one who filed the complaint is completely unable to provide any evidence to prove that the court has jurisdiction to proceed at all and even look at an affidavit? It, to me, it doesn't make any sense. And, and my record of working with people on three continents and getting these tickets and assessments thrown out from taxes to traffic and even felony possession without using affidavits. Okay, so can we ask what your approach is when you actually ask them about jurisdiction? Sure. I believe in, in the path of least resistance. I know that the burden of proof is on the proponent of the argument or the one who's making the claim. They'll tell you, I mean, they, that's something that even these, these violent criminals called government, they'll even admit that much. They know that. They know that. Uh, and I believe that we should take advantage of that and use that because... We, one, we know they don't have a shred of evidence. Two, if I file an affidavit or I make an affirmative statement, they can just disagree with that, and I'm taking a burden on myself to prove it's true, and I have to prove that it's true to someone who doesn't care. They don't care. So your affidavit, you could have whatever you put in your affidavit may be true, just like you can have legal arguments that you're putting out there. It, the, the truth of it doesn't matter. They don't care. So... When you go in, you're keeping the burden of proof on the one who, who bears the burden, and you're making your objections, your proper objections, when they do not answer or provide the evidence, or the judge decides to double-team you with the, uh, with the pros and, and be a second prosecutor. Mm. 
Okay. Now, there are uh, specific, specific questions and objections we're making, but that's the general, the general uh, uh, model that I that I use that has proven to be very successful. Do not take a burden of proof on yourself. Keep it on the one who made the claim, and and you're going to do a whole lot better. It's not a magic bullet, but you're going to be a lot more effective. And just go to my website; you can see. Again, evidence from three continents. Okay, so let's take a couple of examples, and you can give us the scenario on what you think people should do. So let's look at, over in Ireland, we have a thing called property tax. And they're trying to get forced people to, true coercion and extortion, they're trying to force people to register and um, to pay this property tax, which we know is all about money. It's revenue, and it's going in probably the government's pockets, maybe. Um, allegedly, I don't know, um, but they're trying to raise funds through the property tax anyway. So you, they send you a letter, and you ignore them, or you tell them that you're not interested, blah, blah, blah. you send it return to sender. is one of the methods that we use over here, and probably, you probably heard the return to sender um, process. And um, and then they send you a letter, and they say, right, because of Act and Statute number, blah, 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 um, the law says you have to pay this, and yep. they will proceed to take court action. Where do we, what do we do? Well, one, I would, I would advise that when anyone gets one of those letters, do not ignore it, because it, it typically doesn't go well. And then they use that against you that, hey, you had a, hey, you might, hey, hey, you might be right over here, tough guy. You know what I'm saying? The, but, uh, you, you, um, your time to contest this has come and gone, and now it's gone final. And when it's final, to them, it's as if the hand of, uh, you know, Zeus or Odin wrote it. So it, 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 it's bad. I would immediately get on the phone with them and start questioning them on that. And, and taking their arguments, we already know that it may not be set out exactly in the document, but they're saying that the law requires you to do X, Y, Z. Well, they're assuming that because you're in Ireland that their laws apply. We know that's the program. They'll admit it if you ask them. And so once they admit and say, look, are you under, you know, are you saying that these laws apply to me because I'm physically in Ireland? Okay. All right. And then I, okay, great. Let me ask you a question. Do you have any actual proof that that's true? You know, evidence that would yeah. prove that just because I'm physically in Ireland, your laws apply to me. Right, okay. So this is a huge difference as opposed to ignoring it or, or putting in a legal argument because all I'm, now I can use the agent's own words against them. Hey, look, I'm willing to work with you guys in good faith and resolve this. This is what we're trying to do over here. They said that these laws apply to me because I'm physically in Ireland. I asked them if could they prove that, and they couldn't. So, you know, unless – so now my position is – and again, you know, we're going to be following up in writing. I, I, I can't – we need some evidence before this can be resolved. And if, if it, you know, it, it, so at the very least, like we've been able to do in, in England with, with uh, uh, EU taxes, is we can stop the computer process and keep it from escalating while they're getting with their legal department to try to figure out how to resolve this uh, and get some facts, to, you know, to, you know to, to satisfy this crazy you know, guy from Long Island. Okay, so this goes back to jurisdiction. Now, one of the things that you said there is very important, and we always say as well, if you, any documentation you get in the post, whether it's from credit cards or government or whatever, you never, ever ignore it. You at least put a sticker on it and return the sender and send it back to them and say you don't want to contract with them, you don't have an international treaty with them. They're the stickers that we get people to do. It's it's very, very there you go. Thanks, Steve. Steve's just gave me the sticker there. So any time paperwork comes in, one of the we had a, a chap on the, the radio show, um, a couple of years ago called Marcus McEwen who wrote a, a, a great book called How the Banks Are Screwing You and What You Can Do About It and Marcus said on the show exactly what you said Mark he said do not ignore the letters set up a line of communication or ask questions but don't ignore it because ignoring it is acquiescence they'll, go, they'll assume that you agree with it and they will proceed with that so communication tell them no whether it's to return to send a sticker or you want to write a letter to them and ask them to prove their jurisdiction, but it's always good to communicate back to them. Don't ignore it. 
Right. I, I do want to dispel this this common uh, misconception, and it's it's very it, it, it's all too many people you know still think that this is true. They're not trying to contract with you though. So I if if I when I respond to them. I, I'm usually doing it after I've spoken to them on the phone. But if I can't reach them on the phone, then I'll just put in writing, hey, I got your letter. I wouldn't send it back to them unless I just attached a copy so that it was an easy reference. And I would just say, look, through my investigation, I don't see any evidence to support your claim that your laws apply just because I'm physically in Ireland. Uh, so I think this should be abated or a hold on your account should be, uh, is, is, you know, would be required. If you disagree, please, please assign an agent with direct contact information, and so that and put the evidence that you rely on in writing, and and then we can work. So this way, we can work towards a resolution. I don't want to give them anything that they can use against me. So if you start saying contract, that might throw up a red flag and think, oh, we got a sovereign citizen lunatic here. Yeah. Okay. So, no, I totally agree. The other thing that we also say is that to document and verify the obligation I have to pay this bill or to make this payment. I know that's a common thing. I I think, uh, in my experience, the less I say, the better. And so I just, look, let's get through each step one at a time. The threshold issue is always jurisdiction. So I don't just, so if you, if you go to my website and you look, you scroll down the success stories, and, and so we had uh, a, a tax issue with the IRS. Six years they were saying that he had to file a return and pay taxes. All six years were thrown out. All the documents are on my website. You can see exactly what caused them to throw it out. So we never discussed anything other than their lack of evidence to prove jurisdiction that just because uh, someone is physically in the United States that uh, the laws apply. There's, there's no re to me, it doesn't make any logical sense to do any, you know, to get beyond that because aside from that, that the, you're relieving them of a burden, you're giving them something they can use against you. Yeah, well, here's the other question I have. What about people who come over from a different country and then, say, live in Ireland? Now, as a person who's not an Irish citizen, if you want to call them that, they cannot vote on any constitutional matters in the country. So they're, according to the Irish law anyway, what I looked up, they're either called a domicile or a resident, but they're not called a citizen because you have to pay 800 euros plus be, to become a citizen in Ireland if you're not Irish, all right? Which, again, it's a money-making scam. So... If somebody comes over, say, from England or, so, say, from France or somewhere and lives here in Ireland, then if they can't vote constitutionally, then that means they're not an Irish citizen. So that means, technically, the laws don't apply to them. That's my understanding. Well, it, 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 no one has to be, again, this, you, you have to remember their base argument is not whether you're a citizen or not. It's completely irrelevant to whether they believe the laws apply to you. The only thing that is relevant is your physical location in Ireland. That's it. And, 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 and so this idea of voting and all that, one, it's, you know, the, I, I don't, I, I personally don't do that and, and have never voted, but, um, uh, it, it, to me, that, that makes it easier, though. We already can identify the single argument they're using to justify all of their attacks. It all rests on the same one. Hey, you're in Ireland, our laws apply, and that means we could do X, Y, Z. So I don't want to discuss X, Y, Z until they can support their argument or their claim that just because I'm physically in Ireland, the laws apply to me. That's fair enough, Steve. Yeah, Mark, what, generally what they seem to do here is they will send you a letter or a document and they will say under uh, some act or statute, section A, subsection B, paragraph 12 or whatever, that um, uh, this, this tax or whatever it, it may be must be paid. You are obliged to pay it because of the, the aforementioned uh, paragraph in the act or the statute. Now, uh, if, I'm, if I'm understanding you correctly, what we used to do was we used to kind of do the return to sender. And what you're saying is that that's kind of, it, it's it, it, well, it may work but or it may not work. But what, what you seem to be saying is that we should just question the absolute act and statute that they've mentioned and just say, okay, you, you've hit me with this. So you're saying under this act that I am obliged to do X, Y, and Z. 
can you just show me uh, where that act actually applies to me? Is, how is how that it, it applies to you? How it applies to me? Actually, I don't focus on one particular statute or regulation or rule because their argument is all of Irish law applies if you're physically in Ireland. It doesn't. You know, so if you focus on one particular one, it it gives them in their mind a, a you know a you know a way of showing that it applies because it says so. It says right here uh, that uh, someone who makes uh, X amount, uh, you know, has to pay X amount every. So I don't like. I don't think you need to focus on that, and it kind of detracts. And I teach it that way so that it's easier for people who are new to this, who haven't questioned hundreds and hundreds of bureaucrats like I have. Yeah. So that it's easier for them. So the more general you and I keep it. See, this is why if you listen to one of the calls that I did with an IRS agent, this is why I focus on the Constitution. And and it, it, because they've actually you know because you, you because it all goes back to that Ireland has a constitution well hell China has a constitution and every all their laws are supposed to stem from that and try to get them to prove so because now you don't have any specific try to get an Irish government official or a bureaucrat to prove that the constitution applies to you because you're physically in Ireland. Okay, you can't you can't get to anything else until the constitution applies. Well, here's here's the thing, we do have this property charge, and we know a chap was it down in Kerry Saver Cork, where he used the constitution. Now they didn't, they just kind of struck out the case, but it wasn't set as a as a precedent. No. But the fact he struck out the case and used the constitution. Now I have. Um, wording from the constitutional article forty one dot one dot one of the Irish translation. Um, the, the real Irish translation of this article. And it says that we have inalienable, invincible rights which are more ancient and higher than any human statute. Now, they mention acts and statutes, and we know where an act is advanced corporation tax, acts and statute. And their constitution states that we are, you know, that our rights are higher than any human statute. Yeah, but then again, if I, look, if I just look at this from... from the information that Mark has given us, uh, where does it say the Constitution applies to me? Well, here's the, this is the other kind of funny thing. Um, Mark, you'll probably give us your comment on this. But a group of men who wrote something down in over here in Ireland in 1919 and in the US in, I don't know, 1746 or something, how does that apply to us today? And why should what they have agreed to and written apply to me? Why should that bother me? As long as I don't hurt, and harm, hurt, pe- hurt people, harm anybody, rob anything, damage anything, and I have the right to govern myself, why should that apply to me? I agree. You look at uh, Blackstone quoting the psychopath Justinian, the three precepts of the law are these. Live honestly, injure no one, give every man his due. And yet the very act of co- of, of being a government is to not act honestly and to cause harm and not to give everyone his due <laughs> and to violate the three precepts of the law. They don't. And to quote the uh, Lysana Spooner, who wrote about the U.S. Constitution, well, all constitutions, uh, that the Constitution has no inherent authority at all. If it has any authority, it's only as a contract. And it doesn't even purport to be a contract. Even if it was a contract, written, you know, it only bound those who signed it in, in, a, in a way to you know, bind themselves to it. And nobody did. And even if they did, I'm paraphrasing, even if they did, they're all dead. So people look at me like I'm some kind of extremist. Oh, you're some anti-government nut job. You're delusional. Like, delusional? Delusional? Let me give you, let me give you an example of what you believe there, tough guy. You think a document from 1789, over 200 something years ago, actually gives you a right to take my house today? Okay, so let's let let if we're gonna talk delusional, let's look at both sides. Okay, uh, it, it, so I think what, what Steve, what you were bringing out is that yeah, just the, the, it doesn't matter what the Constitution says because one, there's no evidence that applies to anybody today anyway, and what you'd be doing is making a legal argument that they can just overcome by saying. Well, yes, the Constitution says that, but the Constitution wasn't a suicide pact for the government. It obviously allows for common sense regulation to promote the public welfare. You can't do that when 
you have a lack of evidence that's being thrown in your face. Yeah. I mean, looking at it logically, it's quite, you know, it, it's quite straightforward. It, it makes common sense. You know, show me that these laws apply to me. Show me that information. And then let's, ta- let's go from there. But they can't do that. They're, again, they're, they're just making an assumption that them laws apply because we're in the country. Because your physical location. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Your physical location. Now, the, another thing that you said on the um, on one of your shows, and I want you to mention these three things in court. Now, over here, there's different arguments as to what you should say to a judge in court, um, and one of them is to say, if they if you're brought in, is this civil or criminal? Sometimes the judges might get upset with that, and in a case down in a local courthouse, the guy was taken away. And he probably had a bit of a, he was roughed up a bit, and then he came back, and when he came back into court, um, he had his top off. He, he was bare chested, so they roughed him up a bit. And then he said the same thing again, and they, they, he said um, contempt of court, and they, I think he went away for a week or two. Uh, he was locked up for a week or two. And um, so maybe that works in some courts with some judges, maybe it doesn't. But you didn't take the approach. There's three things that you said that you go up and say to the judge. And the first one was, am I, I think it's, am I going to get a fair hearing, judge? Do you want to go through the three of them? Do you remember what you said? Oh, yeah, I remember. I, I kind of change things up a bit and, and tend not to do that unless there is a problem where the judge is uh, prosecuting you. Uh, but there are three really good. I get into that uh, sometimes, and uh, and I, you know, and I explain why how I use the unsigned plea of guilty to kind of help out with that. But the three questions are, and yes, they've been they've proven very effective. Am I entitled? And we've done this again on three continents. Uh, I quote uh, Vin James, who does No State Project UK, who was on the show again last week. I uh, was had a lot of success helping people in England doing this. And I quote one of his uh, a transcript that he that he provided me, where he gave them fits. Yeah. Uh, so um, we're bringing out that their arguments are not true, and that's what the basis. And we're using the Socratic method, just asking questions. So we already know in advance it's not fair because they're forcing you to be there. We want to ask questions to bring it out. So that's kind of the logic behind the questions. So the first question is: Am I entitled to a fair hearing? Which they're going to say, "Well, yeah." Then, can I get a fair hearing if there's a conflict of interest? That's pretty straightforward. That usually starts getting some eyebrows raised, where they may not want to answer directly and say, if you're accusing us of a conflict of interest, you have to have evidence. Well, no, I'm just trying to understand the process. So they'll say, sometimes, you know, most of the time, well, no, you can't get a fair trial if there's a conflict of interest. Then the third question is, who do you represent here today? Who are you acting on behalf of? And that's to the judge. That's to the judge, yes. That's again we're now it's going to usually upset them, but this is only after they've shown their true colors and are not going to hold the prosecutor to his burden of proof. Then we move into those questions. And and what that does is that completely guts their their uh perceptional legitimacy that they are fair, impartial, and independent decision makers. That's- because yeah, well, one of the things that was said to us, and I don't know whether you agree with this, um, we had a chap on the show called Michael Obanichi, and Michael said that the actual system itself works fine. It's the people using it that make it corrupt. So he said the only way that you can actually deal with this is to back them into a corner where they have to say yes or no to give you the answer. And your method there, for me anyway, it looks like you're backing them into the corner because they can only say yes or no, and to the to the way you want them to say it. Well, they can be honest about it, but the system the system is criminal. It, it is nothing to do with our consent. You either show up or they will or they will kill you in the process of getting you there. And heaven forbid you decide to defend yourself because one, you do have a natural right to defend yourself against aggression, whether they have a badge or not. So. Uh, but yeah, yeah, we're asking yes or no questions so that we can bring out that regardless of who is sitting there and their personal bias or prejudice or whatnot, if they are responsive and being fair, because they just said you're entitled to a fair hearing, that requires them to uh, be responsive to questions and give you information so that you can uh, effectively defend yourself. And no, you don't need to. You don't need to go hire a lawyer to explain it to you. 
no, they have the burden of explaining to you so that you can properly defend yourself. And and it, you know, so in England and some other places, they've like in England, well, in particular in England, they they've tried to claim to be independent of the crown. Excuse me, how? And this is where James, you know, uh, got someone uh, uh, pretty perturbed. Uh, Vin, I'm sorry, Vin James in England. Uh, we we don't say there is a conflict of interest. We say, please explain to me how you can be, how you can have or be acting on behalf of the crown, pursuant to your own oath of office, and be independent at the same time. Please explain that to me. I may be American, but I'm not that stupid. <laughs> <laughs> you know? it, it sounds and, like, again, they're, they're saying they're a little bit pregnant. You either are or you aren't. Yeah, you can't be somewhat independent. You either are. Yeah, so you're right. You're absolutely right. And And that's where... They w- w- sometimes they'll say, I'm not representing or acting on anyone's behalf. I'm the judge. And again, we're just going to use the Socratic method and question him on it. We're not going to say, that's ridiculous. You're running your own personal court here. You say the same thing in the form of a question so that the burden stays on them. Excuse me, or objection, I'm a little concerned here. You're not acting on anyone's behalf. You're running your own court. Oh. Yeah. See, this is the beauty of just putting the burden on them to verify what they're saying is true. Because everything out of their mouth is a lie. So you might as well. So that's what someone actually told me, guys. Someone called the show had gotten something thrown out. And he said one of the most effective things he learned from the show was to just assume everything they're saying is a lie and have them verify it. Yeah. Yeah. Because they will. They will lie. You know, we've seen it. I've seen, I've, seen, I've, I've seen it in court. I've seen it happen in court. I've been down there, and um, uh, you know, and even when the solicitors or the barristers don't turn up for the other side, you have somebody, some of the barrister or solicitor actually representing the case, who and he knows nothing about it, and the judge is letting this happen. How does oh, that work out? Yeah. Well, the, the judge is a second prosecutor. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. I totally agree. It's, it's. There's a complete conflict of interest there. Um, have you done anything with foreclosures, evictions, to help people out? To Would you have any suggestions or ideas for that? You know, I would handle things the same way. I've helped and, and uh, on a number of them. I just haven't heard back. And a lot of times people's back is up against the, uh, up against the wall and they, they'll wind up, uh, let's say, getting a loan or something to, to get them to stop taking the house, which is unfortunate. So this, this is why we've had a lot more success when it comes to the credit side, you know, credit cards. Uh, we've had a lot more credit cards Hiding thrown out as opposed to uh, evictions and foreclosures. Those those are pretty tough. So depending on where you are, and given the stress of the situation, um, people aren't always uh, willing to or able to put in the time to to be able to defend themselves. And that's why you know you got to do role playing. I, I recommend that people make calls to uh, sitting uh, city councilmen and, and city attorneys, people like that, and confronting city councils as they're learning how to how to defend themselves in court because they get the experience of asking these questions which seem completely unorthodox, well, they are unorthodox, and, uh, and wacky uh, so that they can get some experience on how to handle these, these professional predators. Uh, and so the time to learn is not when your house is in foreclosure. Yeah, I, which, I totally agree. You need to be learning them before that. Steve? Yeah. Uh, just in relation to the credit cards there, Mark, um, We've we've heard about this before about people uh, they're they're kind of getting large credit cards they're running up running up credit card debts basically and then when when it comes to paying they just kind of go what no I'm not going to pay and they've they've signed the agreements to say you know when when they got the credit card they they put the name to a piece of paper willingly and then when when they've run up a massive debt they just decide no I'm not going to pay it and then they start saying well you you have to prove that I have to pay this but but they've signed a contract and I mean is that not kind of a bit of a conflict of interest there where they have agreed to something and then they've backtracked and said no I'm not going to pay it well I think the problem comes in if you know in advance that they are not loaning you money if you know in advance that they're creating the credit and monetizing your signature and yeah. using your signature to create the credit and then give it back to you and then give it to you and call it a loan, 
then there's a problem because you're going into it knowing it's a fraud. I so I have a problem with people doing that. Um, I'm not saying I won't go so far as to say that they're being bad people and, and, and or that it's immoral, but there is a gray area there. But if you've gone into a credit card situation and you after the fact found out that hey they just monetized my signature and the only reason why everyone isn't doing this is because there's men with guns that will put you in jail or prison because if you and I were to do something like that uh then 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 yeah you're fully with you know fully in a moral ethical position I believe to tell them to stick it show me because it's not a contract because they didn't give you full disclosure and if they don't give you full disclosure you don't have a meeting in the minds and without a meeting in the minds you're not agreeing to the same thing so there really isn't a contract and and you know I ha- can show where on uh, on the website the Michael Scott law firm which is a notorious Texas law firm for going after people on credit card uh charges and they were not they not only did they not deny that that was true that the created it was created with the signature they actually told the judge we don't have to produce evidence at this stage which the judge said yeah, you kind of do, and threw it and threw it out, and we have the documentation to prove that on the website. And would that happen now on a regular basis? I don't. Well, it, it, like so the people that, that that come to me, but ninety more than I'll say ninety nine percent of the people that come to me are coming to me for taxes and uh, traffic stuff, where it's a government attack. Yeah, I don't have that many people in the grand scheme of things that have come to me. Uh, with credit card stuff like that, I, I I just don't get. But the ones that do come to me and have the help, most of them have resolved in their favor and have been thrown out, which is which is pretty nice because there is no evidence of one of jurisdiction, and two, there's no evidence of a contract. Yeah, you're actually giving me some some great information here uh, for for use in a, in a kind of a, a personal thing that I have going on. We have over here in Ireland. I'm not sure if if you 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 guys have it over there in the states. Uh, where if you buy a TV set, then you're required to purchase a TV license to to enable <laughs> not not to enable you to watch the TV, but just to have it in your possession. And uh, over here, what to do is the post office, the Department of Post and Telegraph, uh, they operate TV the TV license scam, as we call it, where all money is collected, which it t- uh, amounts to 160 euros per year. I think it's with the exchange rate, it's probably the same in dollars. So it'll be about 160 euro. Uh, per annum for this TV license and it goes uh, all the money goes straight to the national broadcaster which will be in our case RTE uh, the mouthpiece for the government as we like to call them and I'm actually involved in a thing here at the moment where I decided in 2012 that you know I wasn't going to part- participate in this scam anymore when I woke up to it so I just kept returning the letters uh, return to sender and um, then I got one in there about maybe a month ago uh, threatening that they were going to obtain a search warrant to, uh, <laughs> to to access my premises to see if I had an unlicensed TV set. Right. You know, you'd swear it was an unlicensed weapon of some description. But um, no, uh, what what I would generally do with that, I would just I would just return to sender because that's all we've really known and uh, up to up to this point in time because we we alleged that it was all about contract and they needed your name and your signature to to to, to actually contract with you but now basic based on, on what you're saying to me when the next letter comes in the door i'm just going to write it i'm going to either ring them or write to them and ask them exactly as you're saying uh, about these laws and uh, where, where how can they send me some information to say how it actually applies to me because I'm actually looking at it now based on what you're saying with a, you know, kind of from a different angle. And can, uh, can I interject as well? Um, Mark, something that you should also know, RTE, which is the Irish television station over here, is a semi-state body. So half of it is owned by the government and half is a private company that has shareholders. All right? So it's not fully government. It's only half government. So they're the, they're the propaganda station over here for in Ireland. Okay? But the fact that they want us to pay a TV license because we have a TV, and then they might bring in another law that says, right, you have toilet rolls. We, you have to have a toilet roll license. No, but they could bring, they could bring out one for a microwave. Microwave uh, this, license, This is the yeah. one I've been using because they can, they can come along and say, well, microwaves are dangerous. So, you know, you have to have a license and you have to have it checked once a year. Yeah, exactly. They could, they could just do something like that. Now, you or, know, or like in England because it's supporting the, you know, you know, the BBC. Yeah. 
the media, and and you know that so they that's probably why that some of the basis that they have for that is to pay for the media. That that is, so. I, well, let me just ask you real quick, and we'll get back. And uh, is Vincent Brown supported by this tax? I mean, is his show on a network? I mean, no. Um, Vincent Brown is on a station called TV3, and the only people who benefit from this tax, if you want to call it, as RTE. So they're the, oh. that's kind of state broadcaster. But both, uh, unlike the BBC, over here they show ads as well. So they're, they're, they're getting a lot of revenue from advertisements now on, the, on all channels. There is a difference. We talked about this the other day. And apparently over in the UK, which is, uh, obviously uh, you said this, we probably need to confirm it uh, unless you've looked it up. But over in the UK, um, a TV license is required if you're getting, getting a live feed, that's, that's right, a yeah. live signal. But over here, you're saying that a TV license is required if you have a TV. That's correct. <laughs> Jeez, I would be happy to make some calls with you to these people and, and start making a record and, and uh, question them on the evidence that they're supposed to have to prove yeah, <laughs> that their laws apply and, and then to be able to establish that there's any kind of jurisdiction. And I, I um, I've made calls to Ireland before, but not to a government agency. Yeah, well, I think um, you'd speak to Steve on that one. But we do have something over here as well, which is quite um, key in court, and it's a, something called the Gary Doyle order. And basically, it was a, obviously a case that set a precedent, which means that if you request a Gary Doyle order, they have to be fully transparent and give you all the information they have. So if you are going to court. The first thing you do if you ask for a Gary Doyle order is they're going to have to give you all the information they have to prove that they have the evidence to prosecute you or bring you to court in the first place. Uh, that's pretty nice. You know, we've, we've had a lot of things thrown out in England and also in Canada because they, a lot of judges or magistrates are uh, pretty, pretty good about having, um, you know, the, the, uh, the, which, like the pretrial conference that we have here, but it would be a... Um, Con- oh, status conference. What? Oh, oh, I'm drawing a blank. Something conference. Uh, uh, we've used that in the past because uh, it's like a pretrial procedure. I just I'm drawing a blank on the type of conference that it is. It's okay. it's killing me, but uh, uh, it'll come to me. Uh, okay. We've actually had not only have we had tickets thrown out in, in in England doing that by keeping the burden of proof on the prosecutor, not letting it get to trial, but we've had costs awarded. I think someone had some like twelve hundred pounds in costs awarded against the prosecution. Fantastic. Do you yeah. want to say something? Yeah, th- um, just in relation to tickets now, uh, traffic violations and stuff like that. Um, over here, if a guard uh, or a police officer alleges that you've broken the law or fractured the law or you know whatever, and they write you a ticket, and let's just say it, it goes to court or uh, you don't pay the over here, you've, you you can either pay a fine for a speeding fine or you can contest it and it goes to court and you get points on your license. Let's say you got two points on your license, and if you go to court, sorry, let me let me rephrase that. If you get a speeding ticket over here, you'll get a fine of X amount of euros. Uh, you'll also get two two penalty points on your license. Uh, if you go to court and contest it and lose the case, the fine increases as does the penalty points. It goes from two points to four points. Now, what some people are doing is, uh, sorry, what some people should do, uh, based on my understanding of what you're saying, is they should basically go in and say that, again, sh- prove to me where any of these laws or anything apply to me. However... Over here, what they will say to you is, well, when you registered your vehicle and you got a driving license and you signed for your driving license, you agreed to all, you you, you agreed to basically all the laws, um, the 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 motor traffic acts. So I mean, is so that's kind of there's no really no way kind of out of that, is there? Of course there is. That's a very common one that they will pull out, and it's really easy to get around that. And you say, again, we just want to ask questions. Okay, so let me see if I understand you correctly. You're telling me I made a voluntary choice to get this, that I could have just traveled around without any registration or license? Well, then they'd say that would be illegal and against the law. There you go. So what you're saying to me is I had to sign up for this. Well, Yes, it's compulsory. So, all right, let me, okay, let me see if I understand you correctly. 
I did something that was compulsory, and you're trying to use that against me to support your claim that your laws apply to me. So I did something to avoid it. It, it, it falls apart. So you, it, you didn't, you forced me to do this. So I've even asked them, is it really your position that your laws apply to me because you literally forced me to do X, Y, Z? Mm. And do you? And, and 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 my other question to you is: Is that do you really think that that's fair? I I've never really had too many of them that fought really hard under those certain when you question them that way because I see how ridiculous it is. Every instance that I, I that I can remember in court, they've backed off of that real fast. We even had them where they tried to claim that somebody was a resident because he had a library card. Library card? What are you talking about? Well, he's got all these cases and he cited. Where did he get them? He had to go to a library. Well, here's the, here's the understanding of what we believe. The whole registration process, when they want you to, they want to get your consent or this con- so-called contract. So, and I've seen it with the property tax where they will use coercion or extortion in the words on the piece of paper They say, you better sign up, you better register, you better do this or you're going to be in big trouble, right? So that's coercion, right? So the same with the likes of uh, driving licenses and and everything. So the whole uh, whole idea or the whole understanding that we have with this is that so people get scared, they sign up and register, and then now the contract has been created. But at the end of the day, if the contract is not fully transparent, then it's null and void anyway. Because there's no a meet, there's no meeting of the minds. They haven't told you exactly what you signed up to. Well, and the fact that you're being forced that negates the whole thing right there. Exactly. We we actually had that happen in a, in the middle of a, at a hearing where a, a police officer was being questioned, and I was I was on the phone. I could hear this, and I was participating. And he claimed after you know after the you know because he initially didn't want to ask ask answer the question. What evidence do you have that your laws apply to me just because I'm physically in California? And he says objection. I don't see the relevance of the question. Even the hearing officer for the DMV, the Department of Motor Vehicles, said. Uh, that has everything to do with why we're here. You will answer the question. <laughs> so he said, well, you have a driver's license. Well, aside from the fact that he had no idea that she had a driver's license before he pulled her over, she was then able to say, uh, excuse me, <laughs> and, and went through the, the, the questions that, that, that we, you know, I just went through. Are, is it really your position that your laws apply because I was forced to get a driver's license? Mm. And, it, 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 you know, and then he, was, he had to admit, well, well, no, I don't think you were forced to get the driver's license. What if I traveled around in my automobile without a license? What would you do? Well, you could go to jail. There you go. <laughs> that's that, and that's it. I mean, the cut either way. That's beautiful. That it really is brilliant. And when you look at it that way, you think, yeah. And of course, the whole thing. I don't know about in the U.S., but the uh, Convention of European uh, Human Rights in Europe. In Article 4, states that slavery and servitude are illegal. So, again, are we free or are we slaves? And if we're slaves, it's illegal. It's been defined in European law as illegal. If we are free, then why are you bothering me? I don't consent. I'm not interested. And, you know, and this, is, this is kind of what, what myself and Steve have been kind of thrown around and talking about. And I thought, well, this would be great when Mark comes on. We'll talk to him about this. The same thing over here. Here's another one for you, Mark. I'm going to try with you. People are in dire straits over here, as in a lot of countries they are. They have massive uh, austerity. And what's happening is we have a thing called road tax. And it's a legal requirement that you have road tax. But what they're saying is, if the police stop you and you don't have a road tax disc, you haven't paid it, right? Um, They will take your car off you. Um. Because they have a law that says that, you know, if you don't have road tax, it's illegal, we're going to take your car off you. Now, we know a few cases have gone to court and people have won because um, the police or the guardian over here did not do due, due diligence. And their understanding is that European law supersedes the local law because one of the things with European law is that if the debt outstanding is higher than the value of the item, or is less than the value of the item, then the police cannot go and take a car. So if not having a tax disc is a fine of 100 euros, 
but your car is worth 2,000 euros, well, they have no right to take your property. And plus, you have to consent to it anyway. What would, what would your, what's your take on that? I, well, it, it, you know, we have the same thing pretty much here, where if you're stopped for a traffic ticket, they can take your car and sell it. They call it a forfeiture. Yeah. I, I, I think, uh, well, it's the nature of a criminal organization. That, I, that's what it comes down to. And I think, in, you know, for what I do and what I encourage other people to do is to let them see the true nature of, of the system, that it's not a government. It's just, it, it's, a, it's literally a criminal organization. And to, through educating people, get more, you know, through challenging them and getting them to challenge these local politicians and put them on the spot uh, to where they're confident to start not complying and disobeying and not doing that, knowing full well the risk that they could lose their car or, or, uh, or go, to, go to jail. I, I, I see that, um, but that's, to me, that's always been the biggest problem is being able to uh, inspire or people to do something other than to just understand that the system is criminal and cannot be reformed. It has to be abolished completely. That the, the mindset, that uh, the double standard, that it's okay to lie, steal, kill, and cheat people, uh, it's okay to do that if you call yourself a government. You know, it's easy to, it, 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 my problem is getting people to do something about it. Um, I have been, no, you know, I, I, not so successful there. But I've been very successful in being able to show people the true nature of the system, and, and to where they do something is where it's usually because they're being attacked. They have no choice. Yeah. It's either, you know, um, so that that's kind of you know. Well, I, th- I think your approach is is fantastic because you're pointing out the obvious flaw in the system, um, and you know if they don't have the proof then obviously how can they continue? I mean, Bill Thornton did say jurisdictions where it's at. The, 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 everything stops. Nothing can proceed unless they prove jurisdiction. That's it. End of story. Right. Right. It doesn't mean that they're going to, but now you, you've got, you're able to build on that. Yeah. And so there are a lot like, So people who are fighting uh, tickets and def- or defending against these attacks, keep in mind that even if you go in an initial appearance and the judge double teams you with the with the other prosecutor and gives the prosecutor a pass on jurisdiction and they say crazy things you know re, you know delusional things that um, uh, the prosecutor can argue without evidence which is exactly what they're going to do and they'll actually say that but not in those words they'll say he doesn't have to prove that and then you have to object objection he's saying the prosecutor can argue without evidence but if they are going to push at the trial the issue should absolutely not go away. Because remember, there's two different points of jurisdiction that we're actually talking about when you're being attacked on a traffic issue or, let's say, possession, something like that. You have the jurisdiction of the police agent who made the original stop or the arrest. You also have the fact that he filed his complaint into a court that has to have jurisdiction also. So if they force it to a trial, the well, the first the first issue that you're really going to bring up and on cross examination with the police officer is his politi- his argument or his claim that the laws apply because you were physically in Ireland, and and uh, you know obviously before he gets on the stand when the judge goes to, to you know to put him up there and allow him you you have to object and say no objection there is no evidence that this witness has any personal first hand knowledge. Not only that, the prosecution knows he doesn't have the knowledge, the, any personal knowledge, and that's prosecutorial misconduct. Mm. So you need to vigorously object and let them know, no, this man is engaged in, in prosecutorial misconduct because he is allowing a witness to be put on the stand when he knows he doesn't have any evidence to support his argument. Mm. Yeah. And, of course, it depends on the judge and on what way the court runs because we know where some of the judges over here in Ireland are like, you know. And as you say, you know, if you ask them three questions to the judge and he says, well, I'm, I represent the state and the prosecutor represents the state, well, then you have a conflict of interest. How can the case continue? Right. You not only have that, but you also have to keep in mind that a denial of cross-examination under Anglo-American law is one of the most serious errors a judge can commit and 
I don't remember if it's the, if the standard is the same on appeal there as it is here. I think it's the same. You just have to show that the judge denied you cross-examination, and it's automatically reversed or sent back to the trial court for a, a, a new hearing, you know, where you're allowed cross-examination. I know from personal experience, on th and then also from people reporting to me on three continents, when you start raising that issue on cross-examination, and you ask them, did you determine that, that uh, on your own, that just because I was physically in Ireland, that, that the Irish laws apply and you have jurisdiction, you did that yourself, right? You didn't call your attorney? You didn't call the judge? Okay, you did it yourself. When you then ask him for the evidence to prove that that's true, wham, that's it. Your cross-examination is over. Yeah. And even if it's not ended right there, guys, the prosecutor will impeach his own witness and say, objection, calls for legal conclusion, the witness is not qualified to testify. Hmm. Now you've got a situation where the only witness against you, which is a cop, is, is, the, is, gonna be, is being declared incompetent. If he is not competent or qualified to give legal determinations such as, Alan broke the law! I saw him! That's a legal conclusion. It's not a statement of fact. And now his own attorney... And the judge, as a second attorney, is saying he's not qualified to do that. Mm. He's, they're, that. They're impeaching the witness. Now, that doesn't mean, and we've been able to do that every time, but that doesn't mean they're going to do the right thing. However, more often than not, they do throw it out. Yeah, so, no, it's, I, th I think it's important. Um, and people need to start learning this stuff, the, you know, the way it is, um, and to um, you know, get more into understanding the law to, to help themselves. Now, I know what, I'm just watching the clock as well, but um, can you touch base briefly on, we talked about kind of foreclosures and evictions, so I want to kind of touch base on securitization and tax, um, and just what your experiences are with both. My experience, I miss part, uh, with what tax? With just income tax. Oh, just the income tax, I'm sorry. Um, oh, wow. Um, uh, yeah, I've got a lot of personal experience with tax agents on income tax, whether it's the United States or, or um, Canada. Uh, those are the two areas that I have the probably 90% 90, 90 of my, my experience directly with agents is the United States and Canada. Uh, to me, it... it, it, it <laughs> One, it's extortion. Uh, it's armed robbery. Uh, it, and people only pay under, under threat, duress, and coercion. You either pay or you go to jail. And, and I run it the same way as the traffic. I mean, I've got quite a few call shames that I have on, on my website uh, and actual documents that people can, can get. Um, and if they're not too confident, they don't want you know, I'm still available to do consultations, so I'm more than happy to, to help with that. Um, we, just, we just strike at the root. I, 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 like we've already mentioned, uh, when it comes to uh, one of those attacks, get it from the first form letter. In fact, this past year, when we've got it from the very first form letter, hey, where's your tax return? Uh, we've always stopped the process. I'm not saying we've gotten them all thrown out, but we stopped the process every time. And anyone can tell you who's familiar, if you stop that computer from escalating, more than likely it's going to uh, be eventually be thrown out. Now over here in Ireland, we can we don't or we don't we can't find the law that says you have to pay tax on your labour, right? Now if you look at the history of Ireland and how the whole tax thing, we don't have time to go into it, but basically tax in Ireland was always voluntary because they they wanted people to pay it because of the War of Independence to build the country back up. And when they realised how much money they were getting from the people, they kind of left it there as voluntary. They didn't kind of stop it. They just carried on and then they made it easier for people to pay. And as generation and generation went by, everybody's told, oh, but you have to pay tax. But you have to pay tax. Now, what I say to people is, in any job that you've ever worked in, has your boss or your accounts department ever come up and said, that big chunk of money that comes out of your wages at the end of the month... This is the law that says you have, they, t they have the law to take this money out of your wages. In no job have I been in, Steve, any job you've been in? No, no, they showed no you, whatsoever. Did they show you the law? No, and I, could, and I just want to add to that as well, and I've said this before on the show, uh, Mark, I actually know a girl, well, she's a woman, and she works in the tax office, and I asked, I, I mentioned this to her a couple of years ago, uh, could she maybe find out in the, in the tax office where, you know, if there was a law or, or something that says we're required uh, to, to pay tax. 
and she laughed at she laughed at, the, at that and she said yeah I'll, I'll get that information for you because surely it, it exists if it didn't well then I wouldn't have a job in a tax office uh, two weeks later she got back to me and uh, she, she said she had searched for the information on her pay grade and even people on, on higher pay grades in this in this uh, the civil service and uh, she said yeah she, it's it's interesting she said there doesn't seem to be any law well, it sounds very familiar to what, well, it sounds exactly what they, people talk about here, where they claim that there is no law. And, and I, I can't say for Ireland, I, I, would, I would say it's probably the same as the U.S. and Canada, that, that there is a law. Uh, they ha- I, I work with somebody who the first time he was prosecuted, they brought in 27 witnesses before they gave up, and it was a hung jury on a tax evasion charge felony. He went a different way out of stress being one of the contributors because he was being threatened by the judge. And he did the same thing about, and he asked the IRS's expert on the stand, can you show me, you know, cipher me the law that says that I have to do, you know, pay this tax. And he said, I would take me about three hours to, uh, to be able to get that for you. Well, the jury hung until he got them that statute. And then they, then they convicted him in pretty short order. Um, that's, I, I don't like, I, I look at it this way. I would rather challenge jurisdiction where I've proven time and time again how effective it is, and, and I've been able to teach other people to replicate that uh, in Canada and England and Australia, than to get into show me the law. Because I think when it comes down to it, you probably have court decisions that are ruling against people doing that, and they'll use that against you. And it probably just has been... You're working with people or learning from or hearing from people that just either are ignoring the actual law or really aren't familiar with it. Because I know here in the United States what they use is Section 1 and Section 61. And then, of course, you get wrapped up into a legal interpretation, which you're going to lose even if you are correct. Okay, yeah. so obviously to, to stop it from getting that far is to nip it in the bud with the jurisdiction. Again, it goes back to jurisdiction. It, oh, it's, they call it a threshold issue, and nothing else... Is, look, they'll even tell you. I'm not, I'm not, you know, treading new ground here. Anybody who knows anything about the legal system and government in general will tell you that it's a threshold issue. Absolutely nothing is relevant until that, until that is proven. And, uh, you know, just to be clear... The burden of proof on an issue of law or legal interpretation is one of the highest legal standards out there. The burden of proof on a issue of fact is quite low. It's one of the lowest, if not the lowest legal standard. And you and I, we are not going to win on legal interpretation in the courts. It just, uh, it's not in the cards. It, yeah, see, that's, it, it, that's, it doesn't make sense. That's their game. If we, we, we won't have a, any hope trying to play, if they are good at playing Monopoly and we don't know how to play it, we're going to lose. We're going to have to kind of, you know, justify, as I say, justification or jurisdiction, I should say, um, before we even start playing the game. Um, and I, I, I think, you know, I think that's great. Bill Thornton said the same thing. I think it's a great uh, approach to do it before you even go down the road because unless you're very good and know the system to argue about the law, then I think jurisdiction is, is where we have to go. What about um, securitization? We know the banks are over here in Ireland. We have massive austerity. And there's so many people being evicted or being set, got sent letters from the banks and um, being uh, threatened to be evicted from the properties. What would you say they should do when they get that letter in the, in, in the mail? Say they default on the mortgage because... Now, we do have the official offer over here which is a, a legal um, uh, legally acceptable where you offer what you can afford and that's been working well for a lot of people over here um, but obviously I'm just wondering what your take is on the whole securitization and the banks and we know you know it's fiat currency and they, they take it out of thin air and everything else what was your what's your experience with foreclosures and dealing with people with, like who have that problem uh, yeah, again I haven't had too many people I've worked with on foreclosures. It, 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 it's a, an incredibly stressful situation. Uh, it's very difficult for people in that situation to start learning 
And it doesn't take a lot of time. It's just you have to be in the right mind. You have to be able to learn something and, and put some time in and to learn objections, objection, irrelevance, objection outside the pleadings. You know, basic common sense kind of stuff. Based, which is all based on you know your standard log- logical fallacies, such as you know circular logic. The, the law applies because the law applies, or the law says it applies. So it, you know crap like that. Uh, so I haven't uh, really dealt with too many people there. Um, uh, the back is pretty much up. It, look, at that point in time, it, it really is at the last minute, and there's not a whole lot I can do. I mean, there were a few that came through that I would have been able to help them. If it had been a judicial uh, foreclosure state, but it wasn't, and they really were getting to me so late in the game. Well, I shouldn't say game. I'm sorry. Uh, so late in the in the it had escalated to a point where there just wasn't anything I could do. Because um, I, I don't speak for people generally in court. I mean, in tax stuff outside of court, yeah, I, I do that all the time. Uh, but no, in these situations, uh, it, it just it, it's not feasible. And if you're in a non-judicial state and you get to me two days before they want to foreclose, yeah, it's not going to work out well. Yeah, just a, a quick question, Mark. That's that's kind of came just come into my mind. You seem to be doing a lot of good, and you're, you seem to be helping a lot of people. Now, obviously, there's going to be other people who don't like what you're doing. And have have you ever been threatened? Or has has you know life been made difficult for you in any way, shape, or form? I have been threatened by Fran Johansson, who is the head of the unauthorized practice of law unit at the at the Arizona bar in Phoenix, and I was able to take care of both of those attacks uh, with minimal time investment. But as far as critics, I've not had my life threatened directly, but there have been police officers online who wished I was dead and hoped that I, I, you know, but they're very few and far between. Uh, the, the worst that happened in recent years was I did go as a journalist to the Mesa Police Department and I was uh, put on a list as a threat to officer safety and they were stalking me. And I, it took a uh, phone call after that to get them to realize, I don't know if I'm on a list now or not, I probably am. Um, so I I know that there's always that constant, but I'm not one of these guys. I think because the I'm very open. Uh, everything is on the website. The evidence is there. People can make independent verification of everything. They can uh, always ambush me on a live broadcast. Uh, I'll do live broadcasts with the people. The evidence is overwhelming there that uh, a lot of people have been helped, uh, even people who haven't. Uh, bought a book or paid for a consult, they they still get help from the material. And I, I think because of that, uh, I don't have websites dedicated to what a prick I am. Okay, we'll uh, we'll bleep that out. Don't worry. <laughs> okay, here's a here's a question that well, probably a recommendation. We know that the over here the police in Ireland are called the Gardaí, but I think you would probably recommend uh, for people who get stopped by the police is to just let them do their paperwork exercise. There's no point arguing with them because they have limited knowledge, very little knowledge of the legal system, and all they'll use is violence and thuggery if you don't comply to what they want. The best way to deal with it is the paperwork exercise and write back and deal with it. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I I agree where what you need to do, especially out here, if you in the U.S., if you are of the non-white complexion, uh, show the identification, which is under threat, duress, and coercion, and then keep your mouth shut. If they ask you questions, I don't answer questions, and just keep your mouth shut. Don't say anything. And and then if you get a ticket, okay, yeah, take take care of it the way I've mentioned. You you call the police department later, or you call the prosecution. You ask your for your evidence. You take their statements, you put it into an application to dismiss. A case management. Case, that's it. a case management. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you got it. <laughs> and then, uh, uh, which I don't know if they if they use that particular phrase in Ireland, but they do in in uh, in England and of course uh, Canada, and and then do it that way. The chances of you being shot while you are in in physically in court or a lot less than the side of the street. So. But you you say, you know, stay quiet. So um, 
But if you're done for a traffic stop, they'll be questioning you. Are you saying, just give them your license, let them take the details, but don't say anything else? Right. You give All you do is give the identification and keep your mouth shut. If they want you out of the car, get the hell out of the car and lock it. Yeah, because they need your consent to search the car. They have to have reasonable, articulable suspicion, or there they have to still have probable cause, and don't make it easy for them. If, if, if they've got problem, because it'll at least come out later if they force you to open the car. It'll come out later that they did force you to do that. It was not consensual, and they did not have any because they're not in fear for their life. Yeah. What? What? Mark? What if you're in fear for your life, though? I mean, let's. We've heard before some people say. O- open the window a small amount, just uh, hand out the license, and don't, like you're saying, don't engage. Uh, but we have heard people before, and they were told to get out of the car, and they, they won't get out of the car because they say, well, I, I fear for my life. I'm afraid of what you may do to me if I step out of this out, out of this car. Um, but you're saying that if they tell you to get out of the car, get out of the car. Oh, I would probably ask them if if it's if it's he's in uh, in a rage like one in Arizona years ago did then uh, get your supervisor here and uh, and if you're with somebody you, I I told my wife I said if anything happens to me don't stop until you're in California because we were like you know five miles from the California border at that point and uh, it was scary it was really scary I actually thought that my life is coming to an end this guy wasn't even in uniform and he's screaming at me with a gun and so uh, I would get the supervisor if he's really because he's look what they're going to do is what they, they're going to use the force continuum they're going to take your refusal to get out of the car and they're going to smash your window they're going to cut your face open and they're you know and they're going to drag you out they could even tase you or shoot you so I would say if you're in a situation where you really fear for your life and it's that bad, if you're armed, shoot him. If you're not, and you can safely drive away to a lighted area, do that. But those are extreme situations that usually don't present themselves too often, thank goodness. Most of the time we can get away with, here's an identification. And again, you keep the window closed so that they can't claim... I smell pot and use it as a pretext to um, to search your car. Yeah, I did see a guy do this. He actually had an A4 plastic bag, and he put his stuff, pulled down the window, put the plastic bag, and just rolled the window back up. So in the bag was his license and his details. And he said, I don't answer questions. So There you go. They, he, they, he got, they got the stuff they wanted, but he didn't say... You know, he, did, he didn't say anything else to them. We have a few minutes left, so I'm going to give you a bit of a, a bit of a kind of a stupid situation that I was thinking about the other day. And I'll just, Steve, I want to get your opinion on this, right? This is the farcical side of the law, right? So, and, you know, how does the, the law deal with this situation, right? So let's say you're in the car with your wife, right? Your partner, right? Well, what are we doing in the car? You're driving. Right. Right, okay. You're in, the, you're in the passenger seat. I'm going to use, use it as an example, Steve, right? You're in the passenger seat, right? And your wife is doing driving, right? And you've decided that, you know what? I'm not going to wear my seatbelt today. That's going to be a choice that I'm going to make, right? Okay. Now, you get stopped. The police pull over and say, right, you don't have a seatbelt on. And you go, well, I'm a passenger. So they say, well... Your wife is in the car. She owns it. Well, both of you own the car. But it's obviously registered under her name and your name's on the insurance, right? So as the driver, you're responsible for your passengers. But you say, well, hang on a minute. You know, at the end of the day, she's not responsible for me. I can take care of myself. This is my choice. And it's actually your car, not her car. And I'm a passenger. I'm not the driver. So... What would be the situation there with the police? I mean, if they... Well, Mark, um, from a legal point of view, if they prosecuted your wife because you didn't have a driving license on, they can't ask you for ID because, you know, at the end of the day, you know, you don't ha- you're not obliged to give them ID. If you're not driving in the car. You're just a passenger. Well, unfortunately, what they have is that if someone is in a, in a, in a car and they are stopped, then... All the passengers are required, if requested, to give identification to the police officer. Now, I, again, I, that's absolutely true here, 
I can't say for sure that that is the same over there. Well, I, I don't know. Over I here, imagine it is. Well, over here in the law, I looked up the word obliged in the legal dictionary. And it's something that, you know, um, you don't have to do. It's not mandatory. Like if you, if I come to Steve's house and I use the toilet, I'm really obliged to wash my hands. But I, it's not mandatory. I don't have to do it. Now, I said that to a high court barrister. And he looked at me and kind of, it was kind of miffed at the whole idea that... That you didn't wash your hands? Yeah, um, in his house. Now, it, it was kind of, it, it true him, the fact that the, I, I said to him, the word obliged, defined in the dictionary, is not mandatory. And he just couldn't, he, he didn't have an answer for me with that one, because it kind of completely true him. Um, so, the, all the, the guardie, or the police might come up and say, well, you are obliged under section blah de blah de blah and then it goes back, back to jurisdiction. Back to jurisdiction, yeah. There you go. Back to jurisdiction again. Right, and, and you don't want to get caught into a trap of, of their definitions because you can't always use the definition from a law dictionary. You have to use the definition that uh, first see if there is a definition in the act or if there is a definition in the uh, the title. So if it's motor vehicle, there may be definitions at the beginning. Those will take precedent over any other definition, regardless of how silly <laughs> their definition happens to be. But you're right. It still goes down to jurisdiction. Yeah. And I love to see more people in Ireland, or any people in Ireland, uh, take up the mantle and start challenging these politicians, whether in person at their meetings or on the phone, and... and uh, Get the admissions so that people can see. Because what I would love to see is, I love Vincent Brown. I'd love to see him become an anarchist so that he could start making the same challenges that I've been making. And and the fact that he is a recognized uh, journalist with a with a, a TV show, he would have a lot more uh, ability. And, and there's a lot more doors that are open to him to, to confront these politicians. Well, uh, he, I, I, would, I would imagine nobody would, no politician would go on his show ever again. Well, he, he's controlled as well. You know, he, he will be controlled. I mean, he's just a, um, a presenter on the TV show, TV3. It's controlled media. So I know he's quite cutting edge, but also there's a level of control there as well. Because of, um, obviously he's going to get his, uh, he'll get sacked. If he was to go down that road, you know, uh, but yeah, that that's uh, that, yeah. But given his reputation, I'm sure he'd be able to find uh, you know a position somewhere else or be able to do it independently. Another so. outlet. Well, listen, Mark, we've we've reached that time. I have to say that time flew. It was fantastic information, and we're definitely going to have to do a part two because I love talking about this stuff. I know Steve loves it too, and it's just educating the people and. What can I say? Brilliant. So, okay, I'm just going to pass you off to Steve. Steve's going to get all your details um, so you can let people know where they can find you and find out where your YouTube videos are. Steve. Yeah, Mark, I want to say, echo um, Alan's sentiments there. It really has been great information. I, I, I've, I've got a feeling that we could have went on for maybe another two, three, four, five hours with this, maybe swapping stories and, and hearing some, some, some of the success stories uh, that, that you have as well. But we, we know we are limited to, limited to the amount of time we do have. Um, we do have the link to your website, markstevens.net, which we are going to pull up on the chat room there for everyone uh, to visit after the show. But in the meantime, is there any, do you have a YouTube channel or any other uh, media or outlets where people can uh, find out about Mark Stevens? So the the the, uh, the YouTube most of the, all the videos are linked in the articles, but if you want to just go to the the you know so you could just click on the the video that's embedded. But the actual username is No State Project. You know after the radio sh my radio show called the No State Project. So you can get all the videos there. Okay, and just just w one thing that I, I actually wanted to, wanted to ask you just during the the show, but I I'm only remembering it now. Uh, I was looking at a book there recently, which we actually had. I think we we had this lady on the lioness. The lioness, yeah. We had her on, on on our show a while ago, and she has a book out, and the book is called "So They Say You've Broken the Law: Challenging Legal Authority." Um, have you have you heard of that book, or do you, is it something that that you you can you can maybe mention? I have not heard of it before. Okay, no, that's that's fine. Okay. Okay, Mark, thanks for coming on the show. Just stay with us there for a few minutes and we'll be back after this. This is Open Your Mind Radio on OYMRadio.com, UnitedWeStrike.com, and PeoplesInternetRadio.com. I, I enjoyed that interview with Mark. I know there's some people on the chat room, some people are saying, um, 
that they like the idea and other people saying that they don't like the idea because it's obviously a contract is a contract. Um, but that's the whole idea. It's a, it's a great point of discussion um, uh, to talk about exactly where you go. Now, the one thing that we did say to Mark is, you know, it's all about jurisdiction. So even if there is a contract, I mean, if you can challenge jurisdiction first and if they can prove jurisdiction over you, then you can go down the road and say, well, OK, well, show me the contract. Um, so there's kind of uh, two kind of positives that's, that comes out of that, which is quite good. Steve? Yeah, it was it was good information, and I say it may not be it may kind of conflict with some of the information that we're kind of we know about already, but at the end of the day, it's all it's it's maybe just a different a different thought process, um that that Mark is using. I know over here, uh, we we well, I I would use the return to sender, and I've had good good success with return to sender. And I want to uh, just apologise for something that I did actually say during that interview. And I did say no contract return to sender. And Vin, Vin did make me aware of that, that it doesn't actually say no contract on the sticker. And I want to say that is correct. It doesn't. It's just, oh yeah, I have this thing in my head. Every time I think of the stickers, I just keep thinking no contract return to sender. Even though it doesn't say that, it just says return to sender. But yeah. I just wanted to clarify that. But again, some people do have great success with return to sender uh, and the official offer. And what Mark is saying it's it's just more information. It's it's just an, another another avenue that we can explore as well. And and who knows? Maybe return to sender. Uh, what Mark is is saying. Maybe that the, there could be room to, to kind of maybe mix both of them together, and um, we might have some success with that. But Mark said he he has got some success in Ireland, the UK, and uh, a lot in the states. And um, it is the information is on his website. Now he did actually say to me that in relation to the whole TV license thing and this warrant and all this carry on, he said um, that it, you know if I want it, he'll he'll you know he'll he'll make a couple of phone calls. He said he'd be more than more than willing to make a couple of phone calls and have a little bit of fun with that. He hasn't gone that gone that down that road before, but uh, he he kind of found it laughable and he said he would. So I'll probably take him up on that offer and we we'll we do something together and maybe just record something and. And uh, bring bring it to you at a later date anyway. Uh, can we just say that the opinions and recommendations of the guest does not necessarily mean that we actually agree with what he says. Um, that's the, the uh, disclaimer for OAM because obviously there was one or two things that Mark might have said that we wouldn't actually agree with. So that's actually um, down to his uh, opinion and the way he sees things um, because um, uh, in America, it's a different situation than it is over here because the American police have guns and Eric Gardy do not have guns. Not yet. Um, not yet. So um, we wouldn't be recommending certain things. But um, by by doing the legal lawful route and um, you know using jurisdiction or contracts, then I don't we don't see a problem with that. But then each to their own. Um, we're not saying that you have to do any of this at all. And um, we wouldn't be saying that at all. If you asked us what would you, you know, what are we doing, we would tell you what we we would be doing. But obviously, we're not telling people to go and do it because obviously the new laws that have come out recently saying that um, um, what what is it? Uh, something against the state? Oh, it's one of the, another one of these offences against offenses the state. Offences against the so, state. So, uh, so you can't, or I can't, or nobody can tell any other person not to pay your Irish water bill. Or anything like that. So we're yeah. not we're not saying that you have to do any of this at all. Of course, where do those new laws apply to us anyway? If we're, if, it's, if we're kind of talking about the jurisdiction thing, well, where does it say that that applies to me? Well, there you go. That's there's the other argument. Yeah. There's the other debate. <laughs> now, there also something on the chat facility. People were talking about the registration process and deregistering, and that's what I did. I deregistered, um, and it's quite straightforward, quite simple. You send an email into a person, tell them why. And they send you a letter in the post saying you are now deregistered. Um, and um, I know there's, there's a debate on both sides. Some people say, yeah, deregister. Other people say, oh, what's the point in deregistering? You, you should vote. Well, we, we already know that it's not the people who do the voting, but the people who count the, votes, count the votes that make the difference. And to be honest with you, if voting did make a difference, then they'd ban that as well. So maybe voting is our perception that we think that we have a level of control when we don't. Because we knew there was a, a certain fiasco with the, I think it was the Lisbon Treaty or something, Steve, was it? The um, ballot boxes going here, there and everywhere and not being watched by the, the Gardaí. Yeah, we remember we've seen... Allegedly. There was, there was footage of that where his ballot boxes were, were allegedly carried out and then got taken off to some location and then brought back. Look, 
I don't know if it goes on. We've we, we seen some video footage. We Again, you know, you don't know what you're looking at when you're looking at video footage on the internet. It could be genuine or it could be... It could be just made up. I mean, yeah. I, I looked at a video there recently and it was a kind of a... Uh, someone was talking about lip reading and it was lip reading from Star Wars. Yeah. You know, and they had the characters saying the weirdest thing. i I seen that. Yeah, yeah. I did, mean, that yeah, was very yeah. good for all yeah. intents and purposes. If you hadn't looked at that, Unless obviously you're a lip reading specialist, yeah, th- th- everything was in sync yeah. and it looked it looked fantastic. So I mean, even we seen ballot boxes going missing. It was either genuine, and the guards turned a blind eye, or it was you know a, a montage or a collage of of different video footage, you know, maybe thrown up there to give the illusion that that's what was happening. We don't know. No. But but I mean, as Alan said, and I totally agree, if the voting did make any difference, then I don't think we we wouldn't have a vote. Exactly. So, um. And I know there's parties out there like Direct Democracy Ireland and a few others out there and who relying on votes for people. But, you know, do you really think that these people in government are going to allow any party like that whatsoever to get in and control the system? Um, I think it's just going to be people power, you know, and uh, peaceful non-compliance. I think that's where we're going to be going. Um, now, the two systems, I mean, Mark talks about jurisdiction and also we know about return to sender and no contract. And um, basically, proof is in the pudding. And I know it's we've had success with both systems. So if both work, you know, try both. If both of them have worked, and as you know, uh, people have said, you know, Mark said that he had great success with that, and we know that people have a success with the return to sender and the official offer. Well, then great. And then there's another choice. There's something else that you can add to your arsenal of ways to deal with certain situations. So you know, the more the merrier. The more systems we have. Um, I think it's a it's a good thing, you know. But um, right, okay. Now, as I say, we're going to tidy up the editing on the podcast when it's done because obviously the the server crash and stuff like that. So that will all come out of the mix. Um, next week we have um, Alex Collier, and um, looking forward to speaking to Alex to see what's uh, what's going to be um, what's happening and what's going on from his side um, and news. I know he's done a few webinars, but obviously next week, as usual, is a going to be a free show and uh, getting Alex on and talking to him about um, the bigger picture. Um, and uh, we just have a, a few of the guests. I mean, it's it's fantastic. Thanks again to our listeners who are donating and who have suggested guests to come on the show. I mean, we have a list of guests that we have to um, go through and, and ha- you know, some some weeks we're going to be double, uh, doubling up because we have, you know, that many guests and we have repeats to do as well. So, um, it's great that we have a that much, you know, coming down the pipeline. Steve. Yeah, it is. Um we've only got a couple of minutes left. Um yeah, there's there's so much going on. Even as Alan said Jordan Jordan the uh the beginning of the show, the little mo- our little monologue, um that there is a lot of things that have come up on the radar. We've been asked to kind of go go and, and do little projects as well, but um sometimes you just can't and we did we did hook up with, with a few people over the Christmas period, and uh, it, it was it was great uh, hooking up with these people. And uh, you know who you are, and uh, it, it was nice meeting them. But you know we we can't uh, we can't uh, keep <laughs> we do get a lot of emails from people who want to meet up, basically, and you know just kind of shoot some ideas around. And you know sometimes it's it's just not feasible because we're we're kind of we're family men as well. So you know, and uh, they you know family family has to come first. Anyway. But um, we are coming up with a solution for that, which we'll probably tell you either next week or the week after. We we just we need to kind of dot the I's and cross the T's on it. But we are going to come up with an idea with that, and then we'll explain it on the show as to what we're doing. But we have to uh, uh, love you and leave you. So for myself, Alan James, take it easy, stay safe, have a good week. And if you have any news or links, send them over to us. That's great. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah, stay tuned. If you're listening on the PIR stream, stay tuned for Vin. Vin is going to have Billy McGuire on for the interview this evening. So that's going to be fantastic. So stay tuned there. We'll see you all again in seven days' time. So until then, for myself, Stephen George, I'll say good. <laughs>